So time for some racially charged news of my own. Last week, we sent you a flip camera, and you, you swabbed the inside of your cheeks. Let's take a look at that. Hey, George, this is for your ass. Why does it matter if you do it on a different side? Yeah, I want to make sure I get every damn freeloader in my family, George. Seal it up. Seal it up. Okay, we're good now? So, this is a big thing on the internet. We asked the viewers, who's blacker, you or Snoop? 78% think Snoop is blacker than you are. I was, I was watching that with, uh, with uh, first of all, I, I don't, that's because he's just blacker. <laughs> uh, I, t I told you, I'm lighter because I had a slave cr owner creeper. <laughs> uh, but I saw that last night with Jennifer Love Hewitt. I, Hewitt, I was deaf dying laughing. Okay, who, oh, who do you think is blacker? You? Him? Uh, I think he's going to be blacker <laughs> just because he didn't have any creepers in his history. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's time to find out. I have the results of your DNA test. We send this to the... I'm excited for this, the DNA. Actually. I know you are. Yeah. Diagnostic Center in Cincinnati. So let's have the drum roll, Robin, please. Thank you. <laughs> Charles Barkley, you are 0% Asian. Which explains probably why you can't play golf. Uh. <laughs> you are 14% Native American. <laughs> which explains the gambling. <laughs> you are 11% European. Okay. And Charles Barkley, you are 75% Sub-Saharan African. 75%! Right there. The same DNA as the city of Detroit. <laughs> what I do you like th that. What do you think about that? That's I, your DNA makeup. You, you know what? Uh, I'm very proud of that. Because, I, first of all, I'm very proud to be black. I don't use the term African-American. I, I love the term black. Uh, but I'm glad, because I think everybody's a mixture of somebody. But 75%, that's a good number. That's beautiful. Take that, Snoop Dogg. One of the um, most important sort of uh, hobbies that uh, Americans, it's not just Americans, people all over the world have, is, is tracing family history, searching for your roots. And uh, I, I like to put this up because Time Magazine back in the 90s had, you know, on the cover showed that uh, tracing family history, uh, genealogy is America's latest obsession. It's really simple, clicking uh, your computer, it's as easy as one, two, three clicks. One of the biggest um, companies um, in America is uh, a DNA, I'm not a DNA, but an um, Ancestry um, uh, search database called Ancestry.com, which uh, there are many people who have membership in that uh, and, and provide, um, uh, um, who have membership in the, in the uh, database who get access to uh, the data in the database for searching family history. Now, this is big bucks. If you think about it, uh, genealogy searching is number two in terms of internet businesses. Uh, if anybody know who number one is? <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna say what it is, which I'm sure you all know. One of the groups that has the, the, the biggest interest in, in trying to understand family history and tracing roots are African Americans. Um, a recent poll uh, reflected that 80% of African Americans feel that it, it would be scientifically important to determine ancestry using DNA testing. And it's mainly because of the history of Africans in America, right? So the transatlantic slave trade, what some call uh, a Mayafa or a Holocaust of enslaved Africans from Western Central Africa, uh, created a, a lot of um, lost identity in uh, Africans in the New World. In fact, uh, family history was lost, languages were lost, customs and traditions were lost. And so, uh, as African Americans, there's this very strong interest to sort of trace family history beyond the antebellum South across uh, the great ocean into Africa. And so genetics has been quite helpful and useful in, in, in uncovering some of these uh, histories. And um, 
we now, uh, due to the genetics, uh, can answer some very important questions. Now, this is what I find fascinating because genetics and, and DNA uh, testing actually creates an interesting tension. It's, it's the science and technology intersecting with society in many new, novel, interesting ways, and it creates a little bit of discomfort because we have to reconcile sometimes uh, uh, some issues like group membership, identity, how do we define ourselves? And we know that these um, definitions or these classifications change through time. And so now with the genetics, it's creating an even, even more tension that, that's, um, um, that, that I find to be very interesting because it's allowing us to really reflect on what it is uh, to be one of the so-called racial groups in the United States because for the most part we all are mixed and we have very diverse uh, ancestries. So because of the uh, International Human Genome Project, we can now use DNA to say something about human evolu evolution and population history. So what is it about this genome that's so interesting, so important? Well, we um, uh, scientists all over the world were involved in sequencing the human genome. There's 20,000 genes that make up uh, the genome. In fact, when I was in graduate school, which wasn't that long ago, we were told there were 150,000 genes in the human genome. And then my second year of graduate school, they said 80, then it went to 60, then it went to 40, and then it was, oh, we only have 20,000 genes. And so folks were uh, a bit um, shocked that they were not as far in terms of the human species from the uh, nematode, which is a worm. <laughs> Three billion nucleotides, those, those four chemical bases, A, C, T, and G. Guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytosine. G, A, T, and C. And 23 pairs of chromosomes. And, and, and the, the fascinating thing about this is that we get half of our DNA from our mother and the other half from our father. They themselves from their parents. And so you share 25% of your genome with your grandparents. That is what we call ancestry, genetic ancestry. It's reflective of family history, shared genetics, and we can map out uh, these lineages and, and, and look for these shared pieces of DNA that are in this mass genome of three billion nucleotides. Now, after we sequenced the human genome, we then went on to other organisms. We went to the, the, the rat, the, um, the mouse, which are models for disease, you know, different um, uh, mouse and rat models. So understanding their genome was important. The dog genome was important too. In fact, I, I kid guys all the time, the only other mammal that naturally gets uh, prostate cancer besides the human male is uh, the dog, the male dog. No other mammal naturally. We can, you know, in the laboratory get rats and, and mice to, we can um, uh, induce prostate cancer in those animals, but they don't naturally get it. So what is it about the dog and the male, the human male? I don't know. Um, <laughs> there's always an interesting story with that. So when we sequenced the, human, the uh, dog genome, we found that there's about 19,000 genes in the dog genome. 19,000. So really, there's not a lot that separates us from our uh, best friend. And in fact, that's why some of us resemble <laughs> our, our pets. It's all genetic. Those 20,000 genes are on 23 pairs of chromosomes. Some of them are bigger, so we call those gene rich. Some are smaller, and they, we call them gene poor. Many of those genes uh, actually are involved in susceptibility for disease, like, like breast cancer or prostate cancer, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. Um, and in fact, uh, growing up, I'm sure your mother or your father may have said something to you like, you act like your daddy or you look like your daddy. And I would say to my mother, I, I hope I do, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I should resemble my father. I share half of his DNA. But those genetic signatures that we inherit, some of them actually are involved in risk for disease. And so that's the big challenge. And what gets me up in the morning every day is to really try to understand how the uh, transmission of particular genetic variants impact the transmission of cancer. So what, what are these genetic variants? We call those polymorphisms. Poly means many, morph means form. So we have many different forms of the DNA. So if we look out in this room, there's maybe a couple hundred people in here, there'll be many different um, uh, um, patterns in the DNA if we compare any two people. In fact, we've cataloged over 40, 50 million of these polymorphisms. Um, uh, a class of polymorphism is called SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. So let's say we're looking at a track of DNA, A, C, T, C, A, G, T, T, 
CA, maybe 94% of you guys in the room may have a C at that second to last position, while about 6% may have a T. That's a polymorphism, a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, a subtle change, and we've cataloged millions of them throughout the genome. Some of them have detrimental effects on the gene, and like sickle cell disease, it's due to one polymorphism in the uh, beta globin gene. Um, and and uh, others, we need several, other diseases are due to several of these polymorphisms. They're more complex. So, th so that, that's sort of the, uh, the, um, the, the job that I have, is to try and understand how the inheritance of these polymorphisms may impact the uh, susceptibility for disease. Now, those SNPs actually reflect history. They're like tags. They're like markers. And just like if you're a genealogist and you're searching in your family tree, you have these, these um, um, markers that reflect time periods and who married who and how many children they had. These polymorphisms are, are useful for tracing family history too. Think about it like this. We inherit them from our parents, those, our parents from their parents, and we can then trace within a family these genetic variants, but also within a community. And those communities within continents and it would reflect overall genetic ancestry. So when we talk about continental variation, what do we see, pretty much? We see that um, most of the variation is structured uh, in Africa. There is enormous genetic variation in Africa compared to other continents, Europe, Europe and Asia. And it's mainly because humanity started in Africa. Uh, if you guys didn't know, modern humans evolved out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. They left about 80,000 years ago, went into the Middle East. And when they left out of Africa, they carried with them a subset of that genetic variation that's rooted in Africa. And so when you look at this Venn diagram, you see that the, um, the circle is bigger for Africa compared to Europe or Asia. There's a lot of overlap, right? That overlap reflects the common nature of humanity. We all have shared genetic variants, right? Because we're all humans. We're, we're all one species, right? But there are also some polymorphisms that are restricted to particular continents. And this is important to understand because it allows us to say, okay, this profile reflects one of African ancestry, this one reflects one of European, and this one reflects one of Asian. What I find fascinating is that 50% of the genetic variation, if you look at those numbers, in Africa are exclusive to Africa. That's because humanity started in Africa, a subset of individuals left out of Africa and peopled the world while only 10% of that variation in Europe, 10% in Asia, are exclusive to Europe and Asia. So if you are a scientist and you're trying to understand risk for disease and drug response, you really want to know all the variation that exists in your population, that exists in America, let's say. And so you really have to not only look at uh, people of European descent and Asian descent, but also African descent, because that's where the bulk of the variation is. Now, not only does Africa um, uh, have a lot of biological diversity, but there's also a lot of cultural and linguistic diversity. This uh, uh, figure shows the different dialects uh, spoken across the continent. And you'll notice that in the um, equatorial region, which is in the center part of West Africa, there's thousands of different dialects spoken. So very rich in cultural diversity. Um, and there's um, a lot of different ecological zones in those, in those regions too. But the fun part is this, we can actually look at these DNA profiles and trace the movement or the migration of modern humans. Remember what I said, out of Africa about 80,000 years ago into the Middle East, going into Europe about 40,000, into Asia about 50,000, Southeast Asia about 40,000, and then across the Bering Straits into the New World 15, 10, 15,000 years ago. We can see that in the signature of the genomes of these populations that are descendants of the common ancestors that, that uh, migrated out. This is cool because what it says is that there are no distinct sort of human races biologically. We're all sort of mixed at some level, um, but we do share, and we do share a common ancestor, but we also have more recent uh, ancestry with people who lived closer to us. So the, the closer you live together, the more genetically um, similar you're gonna be. So here we are now in the United States. We're using self-identified race, right? The government, they always ask you, white, black, Asian, you have to mark on your census documents, you go for insurance or your driver's license. Black, white, Asian, Native American, Pacific Islander, uh, American Indian. 
It emphasizes the geographic region of origin of a person's ancestry, which is cool. However, when we think about African Americans, right, there is a lot of mixture. We have uh, a, a wide range, a range of variation in the African American population. We go from Halle Berry or, or Vanessa Williams to Wesley Snipes, that's the guy in the middle there. That's the full range of the African um, uh, diversity. It's quite diverse um, and reflective of different uh, uh, family histories and genetic ancestries. I like to put this up because sometimes people don't really appreciate or understand the amount of genetic variation that's within the African American population. Very heterogeneous, very diverse. And then I put uh, President Obama up there too because in the US he's, he's considered black. However, genetically he's very um, uh, dissimilar to the other African Americans on that page because his father is from East Africa. He was not a descendant of uh, enslaved Africans that came from West Africa. And so genetically he's very, very diverse. Now, I tricked some of you guys. Some of you guys thought that was um, Denzel Washington or something, but that's Vijay Singh. <laughs> And he's not African American, he's uh, of Indian ancestry, so he has Asian ancestry. And uh, in the United States, race is mainly based on skin color. And so if you saw him from a distance down Halstead Road, you'd say, oh, that was a, a black male, when in fact, he's Indian. And so because skin color is this definitive sort of marker for race in America, we always are trying to reconcile these contradictions. I guess VJ's only problem is that he gets darker after every tournament, so you know. Unless he's wearing that green coat, calves may not stop for him or something. So real quickly, I'm going to talk about the genetics of African Americans and place it into a historical, social, political, and psychological uh, context. Now remember what I said. In the, U in the US, we have this convergence of diverse ancestries. We have a sampling of global diversity. We have the indigenous folk, the folks that were here before anybody else. Remember the Native Americans? Remember those guys? Right? <laughs> Europeans. Western Central Africans and East Asians. And so we have this continuum of biological variation that's established through what we call admixture or gene flow. The US is a melting pot, biologically. However, social politically, it's, it's, it's highly polarized, highly dichotomous, right? It's black or white. Issues related to many of the institutions in, in the US, it, they, you know, they're structured around race, black and white. And this highly polarized social political history actually was predicated based on, on, on slavery and segregation in the United States. You had to, you know, once you enslave one group, you then have to say, okay, this group is different biologically. Anti-miscegenation laws, which are the anti-mixing laws where they did not want um, uh, two groups, to, uh, black or whites, to um, uh, marry or reproduce. And then the one drop rule or the rule of hypo descent. I really like that rule because biologically, it, it's, it has very fascinating implications. The one drop rule or the rule of hypo descent was a classification scheme, meaning children of mixed ancestry that were born in slave, during slavery were considered black. And that was important because they had to separate those kids from uh, the white kids that were, um, were, were, both of their parents were white and they could inherit, inherit the wealth of their parents. If you classified them as black, then of course, um, they did not have any rights. But that classification schema created so much diversity in the African American population. So much so now that you can have Halle Berry, you know, the actress, or, or Vanessa Williams, who's one of their parents are, are, is white. They, they say that they're African American, and nobody will say they're not. I mean, it's part of this uh, rule, this definition that started in 1850, the rule of hypo descent. And so, if Halle Berry were to come in here right now and sit down in the front, well, nobody would say to her, you're not black, <laughs> right? We would all say, yeah, she's African American. So, biologically, it created an enormous amount of, um, of uh, genetic diversity in the African American population. And it didn't start with Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I like to put him up because, of course, if you remember the history with him and Sally Hemings um, and their offspring of mixed ancestry and, um, uh, this was sort of the standard during that time. So this was not some atypical sort of behavior. And because of, uh, of, of men like Thomas Jefferson, we have what we call high genetic diversity in the African American population. Diverse gen African ancestry, the antiquity, uh, that old gene pool from Africa, but then also gene flow and admixture with non-Africans. For the most part, white men. And we see that in the genome. We look at Y chromosomes, we look at mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited, and we see what we call sex bias gene flow. 
So most of the European genes in the African American population came through white men, FYI. <laughs> I'll, I'll just run, bring that up real quick. <laughs> the pattern in the United States of genetic variation differs depending on the, on the local histories. Remember, the, the US was, was partitioned at one point by different European powers, countries, right? They would colonize these, <clears throat> these areas. And so they all had a way of dealing with the enslaved African, which was rather unique in a sense, uh, the, the, the French versus the Spanish versus, versus the English. So when I talked about the antiquity of being African, the, the bulk of the African American gene pool comes mainly from um, uh, uh, West and Central Africa, from Senegal to Angola, Southern Angola. That's where 95% of the gene pool for African Americans. Now, that's very rich biological diversity in that area. About 5% of enslaved Africans came from East Africa, which is Mozambique and Madagascar. So we see, when we look at the genomes of African Americans, we do see some um, um, evidence of the East African influence, but the bulk of the influence is of West and Central Africa. Now, when the enslaved Africans were brought to the US, uh, actually it was only about 500,000 enslaved Africans brought to the um, North America. And so from 500,000, we now have over 40 million uh, African Americans, which I find to be fascinating in just that short time frame. But when they were brought here, they went into areas where, that were controlled by three major European powers, the British colonies, the Spanish in Florida, and the French in Louisiana. Remember, we bought Louisiana from the French, the purchase, right? It was a fight, we were fighting or something. That too, but those three countries had a different way of interacting with the enslaved Africans. And so many cultural, local laws uh, emerged um, that were unique to those, um, to those cultures. In, uh, uh, for instance, the British colonies, let's say in, in South Carolina, there were an enormous number. I think it was, the ratio was five to one enslaved Africans to, to uh, whites in South Carolina for, for a very long time period during, the, during slavery. Um, rice and uh, indigo was a big crop. Uh, in Virginia, it was tobacco. These were major cash crops. They created an, an, an economy. Uh, and they, that economy was called the plantation complex, which uh, was very agricultural, obviously. But it wasn't just slaves in, on farms. We had enslaved Africans in New York City, which was a uh, an urban area, it wasn't urban like it is now, but it was more, it was less um, uh, agricultural and more sort of urban than, um, than in the South. The Spanish in Florida uh, actually uh, were what I call absentee landlords. <laughs> they just said, just send the money and the sugar to Spain and you guys, you know, deal with what's going on there. And so there was a lot of chaos in Florida historically compared to the British colonies. In fact, there were a lot of fighting with the um, uh, white settlers and the Seminole Nation and enslaved Africans that escaped out of Georgia that went down into the Everglades, actually fought side by side with the Seminole Nation, in, some, in many cases, against whites. And so there's a history of that, and that's what I mean by these local experiences. And so when we look at the gene pool of African Americans whose families are rooted, family history is rooted in Florida, we see a higher proportion of Native American ancestry more so than we would, let's say, in South Carolina or, or, or um, Virginia. However, if we look at the last census, the latest census, I mean, African Americans are pretty much where they uh, uh, were brought. Many think, oh, during the Great Migration up north, blacks went to the major cities. But for the most part, African Americans in what we call the Crescent Southern states from Maryland to um, Texas. And uh, Texas is interesting because we have Houston on the southeast, and then we have um, uh, Dallas in the, uh, the, the north central, and southwest is, is um, San Antonio, and that's more Native Amer um, Hispanic. But anyway, if you look at the Mississippi River, it's really dark, right? A large proportion of, of uh, African Americans are, um, are still living in that area. You go up the Mississippi, and you see Chicago and Illinois, you see Detroit, and then you look out west. <laughs> you don't see anything until you get to San Francisco in terms of large proportions of African Americans. So, I, you know, I tell my students all the time, you know, there are not, there are not a lot of blacks in, um, 
Wyoming and uh, North and South Dakota uh, and Oklahoma, unless they're playing football or basketball. Um, so, like I said, the most part, they're pretty much where they were, where they were brought. Now, this is what's fascinating. Hispanics, I'm going to go back a second, African Americans. This is the last census. Hispanics, or the 2000 census, it wasn't the last one, the 2000. The last one is very similar to this. What's the dividing line? The dividing line's Texas, right? So we have Houston, African American, mainly, uh, and uh, San Antonio Southwest area, Hispanic, and then Dallas up north. So it's very interesting. Dallas is more European um, uh, ancestry in terms of the individuals. So when we look at um, the census data that reflects people who um, are considered Hispanic or Latino, we see also um, a lot of the Mexican Americans, which have a lot of Native American ancestry, but we also see in Florida and DC, New York and Chicago, a Puerto Rican community too, and, um, and Cuban community. So those, those groups, while they speak the same language, have very, very different genetic backgrounds. And because of Tiger Woods, we could say that we're mixed now, right? So in the 2000 census, folks said, you know, I'm more than black, I'm more than white, which I think was really cool because when, it, once you really start to understand your, your, your family history, your genetic background, the variation that exists within your family, is you sort of appreciate all the different components. So in 2000, who said they were mixed? Where were they at in the United States? Well, most of them were in Oklahoma. <laughs> and this is what, I find also fascinating. These labels change. For a long time, nobody wanted to be Native American. It was considered sort of, you know, bad to claim Native American ancestry. But now, things are different. Because many of the Native American groups have gotten reparations, they've gotten uh, a lot of money, they've opened up um, real estate um, uh, ventures and casinos. And those groups, those communities are actually benefiting um, from their uh, Native American ancestry. And so now everybody wants to be Native American and that's why we see what we saw there in terms of mixed race. So they were blacks and there were whites in Oklahoma who said that they were also Native American. You see what I'm saying? Because it, there's, there's some utility in that. And so I, th I think it's really, really interesting how we sort of utilize these terms when it benefits us. I'm not saying that they weren't, but you know, I'm sure most of them weren't. <laughs> we see a difference in terms of the proportion of individuals of mixed race, West, Western US versus the Eastern US. And, um, and which one of the reasons why Barack Obama, when he went to the West Coast, was, was very, um, uh, you know, he, he had a very strong, favorable fan base out there because many of those individuals connected with him. Um, and and I, I, I also see that as reflective of sort of the history post-slavery in the U.S. So the question is who's black, who's African? It depends on where you are. And in the U.S., as I said, uh, the, the one-drop rule sort of defines uh, uh, folks of African ancestry. And because of that, we now use these um, genetic markers to search for genetic history or what we call personalized genetic history. There is markers called for admixture, which tells you your proportion of African, European, Native American ancestry. But then there's also these lineage-based markers, uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited, and Y chromosome DNA, which is paternally inherited. And uh, if we uh, look at a large enough number of these markers, we can actually place individuals, individuals along this, this axis of ancestry or this space, and you'll notice um, uh, hopefully, uh, it, soon, the, the physician will be able to uh, utilize that information and, and to, to, as a much better um, um, uh, uh, tool for estimating risk for a disease. So what, what does this principal components uh, plot behind me look like? I mean, what is it, what is it explaining? Well, it's explaining the, the diversity. The red dots are actually African Americans here in Chicago. And it reflects a broad range of diversity. The black dots are, Afri are, are Nigerians from West Africa. The green dots are uh, French Europeans. And the blue dots are, are whites here in Chicago. And so you'll notice that there's a wide range across both groups in terms of ancestry, right? And there's no clear dividing line. There are some whites who have more African ancestry than some blacks. You see how those, those red and blue dots sort of mix in the middle? It really depends on how you were raised. 
and why you claim this European or Native American ancestry for some people because of their mixed uh, uh, genetic background. So how did we do that? We use markers called ancestry informative markers. We've published on thousands of these in the genome, and they allow us to estimate with really good certainty um, the proportion of European or African ancestry. These are markers in the genome uh, that um, are exclusive to one group and not found in another. Now, there's not a lot of them because, you know, as I told you, there's like millions, um, there's three billion nucleotides, 40 million polymorphisms. Only 6% of them are what we consider to be ancestry informative. So this, this is a, 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 a bar chart showing the proportion of ancestry in African Americans, which are the uh, darker bar, and the lighter bar are whites, self-reported black, self-reported whites. This is a study out of Cleveland where they were looking at heart disease. And they were trying to say, well, why don't we just continue to use self-report because it, it's probably the better predictor. And folks like myself were saying, I think we can do better using genetic markers because there is no absolute. You know, there's a continuum there of genetic variation. And you see that reflected in the, uh, among the African Americans. In fact, some African Americans have less than 50% uh, uh, genetic African ancestry. Those are people like Henry Louis Gates, for those of you who saw the African American lives when over three years I was testing his DNA trying to find his African <laughs> ancestry. And I was like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And then I saw pictures of his parents and I said, oh, okay, now I see. This guy's, uh, his parents are, are very mixed, and of course he's very mixed. And so it took us a while to find his African lineages for particular markers we were looking at. But anyway, that's reflective of the, as I mentioned before, the one drop rule historically and the, um, the diversity that we see in the, in the African American population. On average, 80% African ancestry in the African American population. This is another way of showing uh, data like that. In fact, I did this when I was in DC um, and, and along the x-axis are individuals and the y-axis represents proportion of ancestry. And you'll notice that for the uh, third panel there, the African Americans, it's a lot of noise. They, you know, they, some of them have high African ancestry in red, some of them have high European ancestry reflected in green. And so there is no, as I mentioned, no sort of dividing line or whatever. Uh, on average, about 23% European ancestry in the um, African American population we looked at in Washington, D.C. If we look at uh, this triangular plot, which the um, extremes reflect Native American, um, African, and uh, European ancestry, in that red square would be somebody like Halle Berry. And I like to use her as an example because I think she's gorgeous, so just bear with me here. In that red square could be her, right? And so you say, well, why, how, how could those three African Americans be so far to, on the European comp component um, in terms of their ancestry. And it's just on how they were socialized. I mean, they, they were socialized as African Americans and so they're African American. It's the same uh, opposite with the, um, with the white dots which reflect the European um, uh, Americans. So the point I'm making here is that these markers don't reify race. It actually allows us to deconstruct social race uh, and political race. So, so it, it's quite useful in the um, biomedical uh, field because it allows us to move away from these extreme um, uh, dichotomous sort of um, um, uh, paradigms. Another group that's just as diverse as African Americans are Hispanics. These are Mexican Americans from Colorado, St. Louis Valley. Um, and you notice the distribution of Native American and European ancestry, that's Spanish European ancestry. Very little African ancestry, uh, West African ancestry in that, uh, in that group. Right? These are Hispanics. So on the census, they said they were Hispanic Latino. We look at another group of Hispanics who would also check Hispanic Latino Puerto Ricans. Very different genetic background. A lot less Native American, a lot more African, West African ancestry. So this is also comes back to this issue of defining these groups. And they're defined because they speak Spanish. That's all. Because biologically, they're very, very diverse. And I tell folks all the time, you know, the West African ancestry, that's why J-Lo has what she has because of that component. <laughs> so if we look across the United States at different African American communities, we see different proportions of European ancestry. Remember I was telling you the bulk of the gene flow came in through white men historically, okay? Um, 
So if you look at the rural south, we see low levels of European ancestry in the African American population. In the upper north, the cosmopolitan urban areas, you see a lot more. The, the lowest proportion we saw so far is in the um, Gullah Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina. Three and a half percent European ancestry. Really homogeneous West African component in those individuals. There have been very little mo movement or migrations onto those islands, those sea islands. Most people are leaving. And so um, they've been quite isolated uh, as in, um, descendants of enslaved Africans. The highest proportion is in Seattle, Washington. 35%, 10 times what we saw in the Gullah Sea Islands. And so it's very, very different um, um, proportion of Europe, European ancestry, and that's reflected in the gene pool. And so remember, some of the diseases we have are reflective of family history and genetic ancestry. And so grouping all the African Americans together from different um, um, geographic regions, different local histories, can be problematic. And so some wonder, why is it so high in Seattle? I don't know, but I do know every time I go there, my, my high blood pressure goes down. <laughs> and cabs stop for me, stuff like that, you know. <laughs> it's different out there than it is. I was born in Georgia, so you know, it, it's a different um, environment out there. So um, if we look in the Caribbean, we see also the same, reflective, same sort of uh, distribution of ancestry we see for African Americans. So let me, let me get into some of the, the, some of the genetic testing. This is um, my results from a company called 23andMe. You can go online and check them out, 23andMe. They look at um, hundreds of thousands of, of polymorphisms in your genome, and they map them out on your chromosome. And they, what, we, what they call a chromosome painting, which reflects your European, your African, and your Native American um, ancestry. And so this is my... Uh, painting of my 20, uh, 20, is it 22? Yeah, 22 chromosomes. It's, the X isn't on there. You'll notice that I'm mixed. Now, for decades, up until, you know, the other day, I guess, I thought I was 100% Mandingo. <laughs> until I got the results back and I saw that, you know, I have 12% European ancestry. But I knew that. I have a European Y chromosome. I have one of those signatures that a lot of uh, three out of every 10 black men have, which is reflective of that gene flow from uh, white men his, um, uh, during the um, period of slavery in the US. One of the things that I would debate my mother about is Native American ancestry. She would say to me all the time, we have Native American ancestry, and I would say, well, show me where, where is that? You know, you have some, are we on some roll or something? And she would say, no, we have good hair. A lot of African Americans claim Native American ancestry, uh, and so it's hard for us, when we look at um, these markers, for us to find that in many situations. And those who saw the African American Live series, you know, they're, they're, we've been debating that for a while in certain families, trying to tease apart and, and, and document the Native American genetic component. It's hard. Uh, but for some, like myself, I mean, at least, I mean, I have some, I have about 8%, which is, uh, Quite interesting, so I guess my mother wasn't, wasn't lying about it. You notice that every chromosome, except for a couple there, have some proportion of European ancestry, every one of my chromosomes. What I find fascinating, though, is because folks say, well, you're very dark-skinned in complexion, so you are probably 100% African. No, oh, no, no. It just so happened that my chromosome 15, if you look at it, is all African. Now, there are three major genes for skin color on chromosome 15 and I got those African alleles. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what's really fascinating because I just use an example of skin color. If we were to find genes for breast cancer or prostate cancer that may have some ancestral component to them in terms of um, uh, uh, history or inheritance, they would, um, uh, this sort of approach would allow us to really uncover and tease apart those risk factors. So as I said before, we are looking at um, uh, different genetic markers to uh, understand the movements and migrations of people. We're, the mitochondrial uh, DNA, which is maternally inherited, inherited through women, we can actually trace it out of Africa and see how those changes occurred through time in different geographical spaces. So we use Y chromosome polymorphisms, we use mitochondrial DNA, and we use autosomal um, 
uh, aims, or these are what we call ancestry informative markers, to estimate admixture. Some of you are saying, well, how do we do this? Well, if we look at the profile for mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited, the mother and daughter in the same household will have the same sequence, the same profile. And the son will inherit that from his mother, even though he can't pass it on, that mitochondrial DNA, he will have it. So that family group there will all have the same mitochondrial DNA. Now the neighbor, of course, should be different. <laughs> and you see the different polymorphism reflected in that sequence for the neighbor. Um, what we do is we look at the profile from the individual and compare it to profiles in the database of different African groups. And we look for matches. And in many cases, we find those matches 100%. Uh, this is just a really um, generalization of what we're doing, but it's reflective of the different polymorphisms that are there. I mean, it's a very highly polymorphic piece of uh, DNA uh, that's um, inherited through um, uh, the mother. The Y chromosome also, what we call clonally inherited, inherited through men only. This is a picture of the Y chromosome. You see the big, the big one is the X, <laughs> and the little one is the Y. That little glob of DNA, that little glob of a chromosome, has created so much havoc in the world. <laughs> so much havoc. And when we look at those polymorphisms on the Y chromosome, we can um, uh, place where in this tree of men, right, of human males, the male Y chromosome tree, where, you know, if it's African, if it's European, or Asian, or Native American, based on those polymorphisms. So, um, those who remember the first series, African American Lives, it was a PBS uh, series that I did with um, Henry Louis Gates at, at Harvard. Um, we, it was 2006, I believe, and, and we tested several people, one of which was Dr. Mae Jameson. She had a very common maternal lineage. It was really common, actually, and it was, in terms of the ge geographic distribution, it was very hard to tease apart where exactly it arose from and which groups. So we weren't able to definitively say where her maternal ancestors came from. But Oprah, on the other hand, was quite different. Very unique uh, and uh, rare lineage that's um, uh, more recent and uh, was what we call the L3B, and it was common in Liberia. Now this is after she uh, said that she was uh, South African, if you guys remember the story. She went to South Africa, she was in love with Mandela, oh, not in love, but you know, romanticized about Mandela and, and the Zulu, so she said she was Zulu. And uh, it was funny because we were taping African American Lives at the time, and um, uh, who, who was it? People Magazine called me up. I was at Ohio State University. They called me up in my office and they said, Oprah just announced that she's Zulu. Did you do the DNA test? I was like, what? I, and before I could even say she's crazy, right? <laughs> the, the other line rang, and it was PBS. And they said, you know, don't say anything. Don't comment because you might get Oprah upset. <laughs> and she may not do the taping or whatever. So, so I was sitting there for like two months. Like, you know, everybody thought that I'd said that Oprah was Zulu, but we know historically there were no Zulu slaves. And so that was just her romanticizing about being South African. Her match was Liberian. Quincy Jones, the, uh, the entertainer, the musician, uh, um, uh, his lineage, common in Cameroon, the um, uh, comedian Chris Tucker, I was upset because he had an African Y chromosome, and his actually went to Angola. That's, that was where I really wanted my Y chromosome to go. <laughs> my, mine went to, to Germany, sorry, you know. <laughs> T.D. Jakes, the pastor, um, he also had a Cameroon lineage. Uh, we then did African American Lives too, where we tested a whole mess of people, including some whites who had um, uh, mixed ancestry, and it was very, very fascinating. So if you get a chance, go to YouTube or something and check out some of those episodes. So I'm not going to get into this part, but I will show my family history. With these lineages, when we trace them to Africa, they're, they're quite interesting because we're very mixed. And so you can have, you, if you're able to test four, eight, 12 lineages in your family, they could all be different. They could all be different. And so when I looked at my family history, um, on my mother's side, my mother's maternal line, it was Hausa, common among the Hausa in Nigeria, northern Nigeria. On her father's side, um, I was able to use my, um, my uncle as a proxy for that Y chromosome, because my grandfather's dead. Um, it was Igbo, also Nigerian, but Igbo group, which is a different part of Nigeria. My father's side, 
Uh, my father's mother's side was from Senegal, Mandinka, so I was quite happy about that because I, for a long time, thought I was Mandinka because <laughs> I saw uh, Mandingo, the, the movie, when I was young. <laughs> I wanted to be, you know, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, Norton, what's his name? Ken Norton, right. Yeah, I just, I just didn't want to get in the pot, that's all, but it's the end. <laughs> but I really liked his, uh, his character. So I was, I was, that was on my mo father's mother's side. And then my father's father's side, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that's not my father's father. But it's a very similar situation. You know who that is, right, from South Carolina. And um, that's his daughter. So. When I looked at my father's lineage, it, was, it didn't go back to Africa, but to Germany and Europe, which was interesting because for a long time, my father would say to me, there was a white three, four generations back in the family, and I would say, it just, I don't see it because we were all very dark skinned. I just didn't see that connection. And then when I first um, uh, isolated my DNA and looked at my Y chromosome, it didn't migrate with the African Y chromosome. It migrated on the gel with the Europeans. And I said, wow, this is amazing. So I'm going to end there and take some questions. But this, um, uh, for me, has been quite an exciting and enjoyable and fulfilling um, uh, uh, last eight to 10 years because um, I've always wanted, when I was in graduate school, always wanted to be able to contribute something to uh, other African Americans in the African American community. And so instead of being um, um, uh, feeling weird in class when they talk about family history and, and ancestors, uh, we now can say something about the African component of African Americans. So thank you very much.